Hey everyone and welcome to another Replay PCs YouTube video. I'm Stu and today we're going to be talking all about small format analog mixers. In particular, I'm hoping to help you choose one to add to your retro gaming setup. In my last video, I talked about that classic pairing of sound modules, the Roland MT32 and the SC55, and different options you've got for connecting the MIDI and connecting the audio. When it comes to the audio, obviously you need some sort of way of blending together or mixing those digital sound effects that you're getting out of your sound card with the music coming out of your sound module. A simple way of doing that is to put your sound module's output into the line in of the sound card. Well, let's recap on some of the advantages and disadvantages of using a mixer instead. The first advantage is pretty clear. It gets you out of that electrically noisy environment of the computer into a dedicated device that's going to give you some better sound quality. Another advantage is also that it lets you mix together multiple devices. You can only have one thing going into your line-in of your sound card, which means that either you need to use a switch box or daisy chain things together. And if you're not quite sure what I mean by that, please do go and watch that previous video. Mixers generally have equalization controls on the channels, so you've got high, mid and low. That lets you get a bit of a V-shape to your sound. Whether you want to do that or not will depend on your personal preferences and also the speakers you're using and whether they're dedicated for your retro rig. Um, so if you've got some good speakers and you're only using them on, on that retro rig with no other requirements, you can set the bass and treble controls the way you like and it may become less important to have them on your mixer. However, I still like um, having them and think there's benefit to them on the mixer across all channels because uh, you can then tweak it for different devices. You may um, have a little bit of uh, uh, sort of different settings for the MT32 versus the SC55, for example. Another uh, great advantage is that a lot of mixers like this one have got onboard effects. Most of the effects are, you know, not very suitable when you're getting into some of the pitch shifting effects and so on. But adding a bit of reverb to your sound can really liven it up and sound fantastic. Of course, on the SC55, you can add some global reverb, but it's kind of difficult to do holding down those buttons. And it's a lot easier just to control it with a knob on the mixer. Um, but you don't have to get a mixer with effects because there's another trick, another way to use something like a guitar pedal or effects unit. And I'll cover that and give you a bit of a demo a bit later. Another device that costs more money, you've got more cables, it's a bit more of a complicated setup and you've got to have some room somewhere to put it. These offerings from Behringer are absolutely tiny. You kind of have to hold one of these in your hand to see just how small it is. But yes, they do take up a little bit more space. So for that reason, I am going to be concentrating on those smaller format mixers up to about 10 channels. A channel is a mono input into the mixer, um, such as an instrument or a microphone. But most uh, mixers will also have a number of stereo channels. This here is the Yamaha MW10C, so it's a 10 channel mixer. But if you look across here, we've got six, um, six knobs or six, you could call them channels. You've got two mono and four stereo channels. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten actual channels. We don't really need something with more than about eight or 10 channels. It depends on what you wanna run into it. It depends on whether you think you might also connect up a different PC. If you're getting the MT32, the SA55 and your sound card, that's three stereo devices, which is six channels. Typically, we want more stereo channels on a mixer than mono channels. You certainly can run something into two separate ch mono channels on your mixer and just pan the left fully left and the right fully right. The disadvantage, of course, is that to adjust your volume, you have to do it in two places. Not really a huge concern, though. But for convenience, we really do want mixers that have got more stereo channels than mono. Behringer in particular are bad for this. They're not the only manufacturer that do it, but in terms of the model number, they number them according to inputs rather than channels. They're older models, they referred to by the number of channels. So like for example, the MX602A is a six channel mixer and the newer equivalent is the 802, the Xenix 802, um, which is not an eight channel, it's still a six channel mixer, but they're including in that numbering a couple of extra inputs being either the tape inputs or the stereo aux returns. So not quite sure what they're doing there, 
but just that's something to watch out for. Always have a look at the picture and count the channels manually rather than relying upon the model number. But I am going to be going through about 18 different models that I consider suitable today um, and sort of some of the pros and cons of them or the ones that I favour or, or don't. These are actually all models that I have at some stage looked at personally and researched myself um, as part of my own journey. So I have done that research and looked at, you know, what do I consider would be good or bad about this particular model? So the models that we're looking at are mostly from Behringer and Yamaha with a couple from Mackie. Behringer for their small format mixers do have a bit of a bad reputation and if you read for reviews on them you'll find that pretty quickly. People talking about it crapped out on them in the middle of a gig or it's got noisy outputs. Bear in mind that Behringer themselves call these a PA mixer so I think they're really marketed or aimed more towards your bedroom musician, um, that PA type scenario, um, podcasters as well as opposed to mixing for some sort of live sound situation. So yeah, they're made to that price point, they don't have the greatest audio quality, but for our use they are certainly, in my opinion, quite sufficient. So I'm really focusing today on those ones that are quite common, um, particularly on the second-hand market, and aren't going to break the bank, and I consider to be really quite suitable. So let's start with Behringer. So I mentioned the MX602A, that's an older model, the Eurorack line, um, and it is a six-channel mixer, plus you've got the Stereowox returns and the tape input. The Stereowox returns have got the level control there, whereas the tape inputs don't. So strictly speaking, you could add up to 10 stereo devices to this. So you're using your two mono channels, for something like say your retro PC um, and then the uh, stereo channels there for the MT32 and the SE55 that leaves you the stereo aux returns which if you're not going to be using a little effects pedal using the trick that I'll show you later you could always connect something else up and you do have the um, level control but bear in mind that quite often uh, the aux returns are at a lower overall level anyway than the other channels and so therefore you probably need to turn everything else down a little bit to get a decent balance. And then you've got the tape inputs which don't have uh, level control at all. So again, they're probably going to be at Unity. If you are using those and you want to use it as part of a mix, so mixing it with other things, then you're going to need to have everything else turned down. However, something like this can be really useful if you do want to use another PC into it because you're sharing a set of speakers. You can control the volume on that PC, you're not really caring about mixing anything together, it's just an extra input to get sound through into that same set of speakers. So from what I can tell, the newer offering from Behringer after the Eurorack line is the Zenix line, and so the equivalent to the 602A is kind of the Zenix 802 now. Not much to say there, um, aside from what I mentioned before with the model numbering. Otherwise, um, you know, we've got the Zenix preamps and so on. Um, for our purposes, I don't think you're really going to notice that much difference. Now, in their current line as well, and this is where their numbering gets a little bit strange, they've also got the QX602 MP3, which is where they've basically removed those tape inputs from the 802 and added a little MP3 player instead. Um, you might want that, you might consider it useful, but generally the 602 MP3 is a little bit more expensive. If you can find one second hand at a good price, it's worth considering though, because it also has that X in the model number, a model name, is actually referring to the fact that it's got some onboard effects. Now I haven't looked at the effects of this one in detail. It's not a full effects unit like some of their other models, but it does have reverb. So it might be something worth investigating if you, as I said, if you can get one cheap. Then you've also got the um, Q802 USB. Something to watch out for with some of the mixers that offer a USB interface is that generally the USB interface is going to take over a couple of the other inputs or channels. So just watch out for that, particularly on uh, like some of the Yamaha ones. Again, it depends on whether you actually want to use it as a USB interface anyway if you're sharing it for multiple purposes. The next model is, now we're getting into the uh, tens, the 10 channel, supposedly 10 channel offerings from Behringer. And you've got the Q1002 USB. I typically wouldn't really um, advise looking at this one because the only difference between the Q1002 USB and the 1002 FX is that the USB one has USB versus the effects unit on the 1002. So if you don't care about USB, which you probably don't if you're anything like me, 
um, for these purposes, then if you're looking at the Q1002 USB, you might as well look at the 1002 FX instead because then you get the effects unit. The downside, however, once you're getting into these 10 channel offerings from Behringer, is that they drop out the EQ on those channels. So when you look at the 1002 USB, and again, this is why I don't recommend it because you're losing the EQ on all of these for the sake of keeping it nice and compact. We've got channels 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, 10 here. Um, with no EQ. So if you're going to lose the EQ, you may as well be adding something, and I think that it's worth it for the effects, but not worth it just to get a USB interface. The 1002B is effectively your 10 channel with faders on it instead. So the 1002B is quite a nice unit, it's quite compact, uh, it's just that sort of landscape form factor instead. But if you're looking for something with faders, the 1002B is the only thing I've found that is really quite compact. After that, again, an older offering from Behringer in the Eurorack line being the MX802A, and that's one that I would suggest is really quite suitable if you're looking for effectively um, what they would now call a 10 input mixer. It's an eight channel or 10 input. It's got the tape inputs and it's got the um, stereo aux returns, so it's useful for either an additional input there or using with uh, the uh, guitar pedal trick that I'm going to show you a bit later. So then of course we've already mentioned the 1002 FX, which is a great option as well for something that's compact, doesn't break the bank and gives you some nice effects on board. Let's look at the offerings from Yamaha now. So the older models you have things like the MW10 and MW10C. The C stands for compression and basically with the models that have got compression you see the extra knobs here on the first two channels but the downside is that they do drop out the mid EQ control on the um, stereo channels there. Um, so my preference would actually be the MW10. It's a little bit shorter as well um, rather than the MW10C. Oh, by the way, the MWs have got the, um, the USB as well in case you want it, but it does replace um, the two track in. So the next model was the MG10-2 and the MG102 or 102C, which was the equivalent to the MW10C. Really uh, all great options and I would definitely recommend any of those if you don't mind something a little bit bigger, but that does have um, more inputs and a better quality um, build to it, better components, better reputation and so on than the Behringer. Um, especially considering that you've got not just a true 10 channel mixer but you do also have the um, stereo aux returns and the tape in and with these the tape in has got a level control as well. Um, the tape in level is higher than the aux returns though so you, in practice you wouldn't really use the aux returns as um, for a separate device but it is great for the effects unit trick that I'll tell you about. Now the latest models, equivalent models from Yamaha are the MG10 and the MG10XU. The XU having onboard effects. Now the difference um, or one big difference between the older models like this and the current MG10 series is that they change the number of mono versus stereo channels. So on the MW10 and 10C, the MG10-2, the MG102C, you've got two monos and four stereo channels to make up your total of 10. On the MG10, they've changed it and instead of seeing six knobs across the bottom, here you'll see seven because they've got four mono channels and then three stereo. So in my opinion, they're kind of less useful for us, for our particular use case, where we want more stereo input stereo channels than we do the mono ones. Nevertheless, the MG10s, they're also gonna cost you more, even second hand because they are a newer model. Uh, but nevertheless, the MG10s are a great option and the MG10XU if you are looking for something with the onboard effects. However, there's another model, older model that I haven't mentioned yet and that is the MG82 or 82CX. This is an eight channel mixer. It has still got the same number of stereo channels as your MG, current MG10 and MG10XU, being three stereo channels. On the MG82CX, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But it also has that onboard effects. 
Now the MG82CX is probably going to cost you a little bit more second hand and I haven't tried one yet but if you can get your hands on one at a cheap price I think it could be a really fantastic option. You've got the same footprint as the MW10 or the MG10-2 and you've got the onboard effects, you've got three stereo channels, you've still got the um, stereo aux returns as well and the tape input so it could be a really fantastic option if you can get one cheap. There are a couple of models from Mackie that are also worth mentioning. The Mackie ones are obviously going to cost you a little bit more. Um, you've got the 802 VLZ3 or VLZ4 and also the 1202 VLZ Pro or 1202 VLZ3 I think they're up to now. Um, I actually thought about getting a 1202 to um, consolidate and replace these two mixers. Uh, in the end I went for something else, a digital mixer instead. But the 1202, um, you've got a true 12 channel mixer plus the other inputs as well. The 802 likewise you have a true 8 channel mixer plus the other inputs. These are really great quality, very very versatile mixers. Um, with some fantastic extra options that you can use if you're wanting to run multiple sets of speakers and so on um, because they are that sort of professional mixer that are useful for a live sound or even a small studio type arrangement. The other one from Mackie worth mentioning is their Mix 8, but this is where Mackie as well have done a similar thing with their numbering. The Mix 8 is not an 8 channel mixer, it's 6 plus, you've got those stereo aux returns. You've also got from Mackie the Pro FX line, such as the Pro FX 8, but these are ones that are getting into um, the bigger mixers because they do have those separate faders for all of the channels as well. And you're going to be looking at considerably more money. Even second hand, you're going to be spending into the hundreds versus you could get your whole setup going for well under $100. So now let's spend a little bit of time talking about effects. You've got two options, one is your mixer that's got effects on it and the other is using something like a little guitar pedal with your aux send and aux returns on a different type of mixer. So I didn't also mention this, this is the uh, effects list for the Behringer 1002 or 1202 FX and most of them are actually reverb. The first 50 here are all, all pretty much reverb, then you get into the delays that are pretty much the same as a reverb. Some of the modulation effects like flanges and pitch shifters that you're not really going to use and then some of the combination ones. I've actually been through all 100, Just it's, it's a lot of fun I have to say. Um, in practice though you're not going to use most of them, you'll kind of settle on um, a couple of favorite reverb effects and leave it there. So the one that I was using most of the time was this one, number seven, big hall two, approximately 3.2 second reverb delay, decay, sorry, um, which sounded quite good because I found that a bit of reverb is, it doesn't matter too much what the reverb type is, it doesn't even matter too much what that decay setting is. Um, what matters more is the actual overall level of reverb because it's kind of easy to overdo it. Um, obviously with a mixer you've got a preset number of effects. On the Yamaha ones they have less than Behringer, um, they're probably better though I would guess. Um, but with a reverb pedal on the other hand, in a, in a sense you've got an infinite number of effects because with this one um, we've got the type of reverb here, we've got, uh, let's see if I can read it, room, hall, church, spring, plate, studio and a modulated type reverb. Um, additionally you've got the level control and you've also got the decay and tone so you kind of end up with effectively, um, particularly with the decay level, an infinite variety of reverbs but in practice you're probably going to set it um, to one that you like and then just adjust the level. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get these set up firstly with a 1002 FX and demo that to you and then I'm going to show you how you can use a reverb pedal and a little bit, little bit of the I suppose pros and cons or things to watch out for there. So here we have the effect level set uh, midway, so 12 o'clock on that channel and I've got uh, that reverb effect 7 that I mentioned before dialed in and initially I will have the uh, master effects level here turned right down and then I'll just turn it up so that you can hear the difference. did have a few challenges with getting, getting the uh, overall level set appropriately so hopefully this time it sounds really quite good. Here we go. Turn it up. 
So that's really an overpowering level of reverb. You wouldn't have it that high. So let's turn it back to what's probably a more appropriate level. And if I do turn it up on the channel as well, you'll hear it just goes ridiculous. You realistically would not be running it that high. So you just want that kind of subtle effect. And uh, that subtle effect is highlighted really quite well with the uh, little percussion demo that we've, uh, percussion part that we've got coming up. So we'll turn it right down and then turn it back up again halfway through that percussion section. So I hope that um, lets you hear what the uh, reverb can be like. You can obviously go completely overpowering. Um, you can also have it at a more appropriate level. As I said, the, the aim is to try to get something that you don't even really notice it's there eventually until you turn it off. And that's when you realize the richness that it's been adding. And obviously it depends upon the, the game as well. Some soundtracks work better with it than others. And so you might have a little bit more on some games than others. But it is a lot of fun to experiment with. All right, so now let's look at the other option being the Yamaha MW10C with the reverb pedal. Right, so here we have the Yamaha MW10C hooked up to the little Donna guitar reverb pedal. So I've got the aux send into the pedal, then the pedal out into the left channel of the stereo aux return. Left for mono, it doesn't matter about mono versus stereo just for the effects. Um, for the power, I'm just using another standard Roland power adapter um, that is the 9 volt DC center negative, same as your sound modules, so you can use one of those DC power splitter cables to get power to your pedal if you want. A couple of things to watch out for though is your aux send and return are typically at line level on your mixer, whereas guitar pedals are wanting an instrument level signal. However, most pedals are going to be okay with a line level because they're designed to also go into the effects loop of an amp and particularly your time-based um, effects like your reverb and delay. So if it isn't okay with a line level signal, um, you can either use you know, a reamp type box and so on, but then we're getting way too complicated and I don't think you really need to worry about that. Um, I did find that it wasn't too hard to overdrive this pedal and get some clipping and distortion, but it didn't matter too much because for the levels that we're wanting to send to it anyway, um, it, it, uh, it was actually perfectly okay at those more realistic lower levels. The other thing to watch out for is that your when you have this kind of set up your um, aux send level on the channel and the return level are also going to affect your overall volume of that music. So it makes it a little bit harder to get the level set correctly. If you do want to stash the pedal away somewhere out of sight um, to save on that clutter, just be aware that when you do adjust your levels it's a little bit more complicated. Again, it might not matter too much, might not bother you because you've kind of set it properly at the start of the game and then you might only be adjusting the, the relative balance of the, uh, of the music versus the digital sound effects anyway, so it might not matter too much. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, give you the Monkey Island demo again. You'll see when I turn the pedal on and off, um, and I've, I will set all of the um, EQ on this channel to being flat as well, just for a more fair comparison with the 1002 FX, and we'll come back to that at the end and show you why I think effects, um, sorry, having EQ and effects is a really great way to go.
appropriately high level of uh, reverb there, but just having a little bit, a subtle amount, um, you can still get it from the pedal and it's a great way of um, to go. And as I said before, you know, you've got the different types on there if you do want to experiment as well. But let's have a listen to that percussion section. So we also mentioned about the EQ, so I've got the EQ set flat at the moment. Let's have a listen, so bear in mind the speaker settings are the same as the previous demo. Uh, let's have a listen when we do boost the highs and the lows and take out a bit of mid. So there you go, I think, uh, I hope that you could actually hear the difference that that EQ made as well, um, because I think that even when you've got speakers that have got some sort of bass and treble controls, it is nice and um, the mixer does add something else because of the different sort of EQ curves as well. Um, so I think it's really worth it. So therefore, some of your options, it's actually cheaper to get uh, like a secondhand uh, Behringer 802 and some sort of um, cheap guitar pedal. Behringer also do a digital reverb pedal, the DR600. Uh, which I think brand new is about 60 bucks so um, second hand if you could pick one up for 30 or 40 you could probably pick up a Xenix 802 for 50 or 60 bucks second hand so for under hundred dollars you've got a great combination there if you don't mind the extra clutter of the guitar pedal um, otherwise something like the 1002 FX I mean even brand new they're pretty cheap the 1002 FX brand new here in Australia at the moment is about 130 bucks um, which you know it's, it's affordable but if you do pick one of those up second hand um, you're probably looking at still around the 90 or 100 dollar mark anyway for that because they tend to fetch a bit of a higher price than the ZX 802. But if you want that all-in-one solution, uh, I'd recommend having a look around for a cheap Yamaha MG82CX. Could be a really great way to go if you can find one cheap, but uh, unfortunately they don't seem to come up that often and they do tend to fetch a bit more secondhand. So that's enough for now today anyway. Um, as always, if you do like the video, please give us a thumbs up, click that subscribe button, and I'd love to hear from you uh, what you think in the comments. If you've got any other uh, recommendations for mixers that you've looked at or have any other questions or just general comments, please do, do uh, say hi, give us a shout out, and tell me what you think. Thanks everyone, and see you next time. Bye for now.